I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. In part one, which was also available today, we talked about how to do your own moonshot and why it's important. Even though everyone tells you you can't, it makes it even more important that you try. And in part two, we're going to talk about what's going on in the 2024 elections and what's going on in the economy right now. All right, so tell me, what is up with the economy and what, you know, can we start gaming 2024 elections. Oh, Jesus. Um, all right. Why don't we go with the easy part, which is what's going on in the economy. So a couple things in the data. So a little background, right? Again, if you haven't heard me on previous interviews um, with my, I have a partnership with the largest data collection analytics and AI company in America. Uh, in our database, we have 240, Amer 240 million American consumers 550 million plus connected devices. We're tracking 10 billion with a B, 10 billion online purchasing decisions every day and a trillion searches every day. And so we are, you know, for the first, I guess, year of the pandemic, we were putting out free reports on what's going on with the consumers and the economy and, you know, all the trends, everything that was changing. Uh, eventually, I just got too damn busy with work and I just couldn't put these things out for free all the time. So, um, but we are still looking at the data and helping our own clients on this. And a couple of things that are popping right now that I think are super interesting. Um, I can go macro or micro. How would you like me to start? Well, that's an interesting question because, my, yeah. so so let's just define those terms. Because so okay. micro is, might be something like, oh, what what business might I should I start right now? No, it's kind of like what consumers are most concerned about in the economy right now. And then the micro is for the clients we work with. We're sending seeing certain marketing trends right now that okay. are leaving that people are spending a lot of money on that they shouldn't, and a lot of platforms that they should be spending on money on right now um, that they're not. Let's start with macro. And can I guess a little bit? Okay, go ahead. So I think consumers are worried about inflation. Mm. I, I think consumers are worried about um, supply chain, i.e., are they going to get yes. the things that they would like? Mm -hmm. uh, I think they are worried about 
I want to say they're worried about employment, but not in the usual way. They're not going to be worried that they're not going to be without a job, but the job market is so weird right now. It's well, never I want been to talk this weird. about that. That's something okay. I really want to get in with you with, but yeah. So okay. you want me to start so, there? Yeah, yeah, let's go. All right. I'm, how about this? Can we, let's, let's gamify this for a second. Okay. Sure. I'm going to ask you a question. You tell me the percentage you think it is. Okay. All right. The question that we've asked and modeled into our data was, whose medical opinions do you trust in regard to whether or not you would be willing to get the COVID-19 vaccine? Okay? So the opinions you trust the most, right? Politicians, what, do you, what percentage do you think on a scale of zero to 100? Zero. No, I mean, l- realistically. I, realistically, why, why would anyone trust a politician on medical stuff? But okay, t- 15%. Okay, 3.3% right now. Yeah, so close That's to the zero. trust <laughs> yeah. factor. Uh, Fauci. Uh, that I'll go with 10 to 15%, only because he, you, you always have to look at, wh- whenever anyone tells me anything, it's not that I'm paranoid or, dis- or I distrust people, but I always ask myself, well, what is their agenda? And ideally, you want them to be either agendaless or have an agenda similar to yours, really agendaless. And Fauci has too many agendas. And I'm not always, I'm not saying bad or good. I, I really don't know enough. And other people have done far more research on this, but it does seem to me he at, very, at the very least has a political agenda. He likes the position he's in. And But Trump had a political agenda and he got 40, you know, 8% of the vote, right? So, I mean, everybody's got a political agenda that's out there, right? So you're, you're not close on that one. It's 35.1%. Okay. But that makes sense because the vaccinated and the people that are demanding vaccinations are probably all behind him. It probably right. represents about 35% of the population right now. Right. Not, I understand the majority of people are vaccinated, but there's a lot of people vaccinated right now that say we should be free to have our own choices, even the people that are vaccinated, right? Right, right. So, um, okay. Uh, the media, Who's medical? Uh, the media expressing medical opinions on the COVID night and whether you'd be willing to get the vaccine or not. If this was 1975, I would yeah. say 80 percent. Yeah. But in today's day and age, I'm still going to go with 10 to 15 percent because everybody with a brain knows that every single media outlet now is biased. Yeah, on either side. Yeah. 3.2 percent trust. Okay. Isn't that nuts? Politicians and media. 3.3 percent. 3.2 percent. That means and- like 90. We're talking 96% or more and, do and not just, trust. And, and let me just comment on that for a second. In, in, I could be wrong about 1970, but it seemed to me that the reason the media was more neutral and more trustworthy is that there were really only three or four news outlets uh, that were significant. Right. And they were so large and so powerful that they didn't have to cater to the interests of a political agenda. Mm-hmm. So they were a lot, like r- journalists didn't vote because they were, they, they really were, took it seriously, their, their need to be neutral and unbiased. Right. But right. now, I mean, I even notice this as a writer and a podcaster and so on. If I wanted to have like 20 times as many listeners or followers, I would go either full, yeah. full blown left wing or full blown right wing. Or just go full blown Bitcoin. <laughs> right. Or, or full blown Bitcoin. Cause that's another <laughs> agenda as well. It doesn't have to be just two, but, um, <laughs> But I don't, I don't do that. I have respect for my listeners and, yeah. and respect for myself. And, uh, uh, but because of economic reasons, media outlets, you know, they're multi-billion dollar mm-hmm. companies. They've had to take uh, an unbiased view in order to keep making a profit, unfortunately. Sure. So there's, they can't be trusted on anything. And I'll give one more thing to unpack. Uh, you know, throughout the years, media outlets have sometimes, I've sometimes done something for good or for bad that has generated articles about me. And not out of, let's say hundreds of articles written about me, not a single one has been a hundred percent true. They've always contained very obvious, often malicious yes. misrepresentations. So if that's just me noticing it, that means everybody must notice a- every it. Every article that's ever, I've ever had on me has missed so many things. And I'm like, I, I told them this. Why did right. they just I've t- That's what it? I say too. I've told them this. Yeah. And they repeated it back to me. Right. And they still uh, maliciously lied in some cases. In some yes. cases, it might be just stupidity. But uh, but I, I think nobody could trust the media. If, if if I can't even trust it on something as simple as an article on myself, how do I know any Correct. article on anybody else is accurate? So so yeah. yes. Okay. So personal doctor is number one. 
uh, in the trust factor, and it's at 55%. Which is very low for personal doctors, I would say. Yeah, I think there's a lot of distrust right now, right? Yeah. Family and friends being the ones that people go to, to whether or not they should get vaccinated or not, is at 27%. That, those are the top ones. I don't have any more than that. Um, I, I would but think I thought family that was and friends would be more because when I look at my Facebook feed, of course, it seems like it's almost 50-50 people arguing about yeah. vaccine mandates. And it's like very smart people on, on both sides. If you just look at your friends and family, if you look at my friends and family, you would be very confused because it's like they're all like very smart people and they say completely opposite things. And, and it, that's why it confuses they only me. trust a portion of them. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, 71.4% of Americans feel like they are struggling right now in the economy. That's so interesting too, because there's also... Uh, the rich are getting richer type of thing. Well, that's it. There's a 20, what, 28.4% or 28.6% uh, is like, this is exponential growth period. I mean, Elon Musk is worth $300 billion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is insane. I don't even know how to wrap my head around that. Like that's insane. And, and I'm not, I'm not a wealth inequality person. I think if anybody does well, everybody does well, yep. but, but clearly Maybe not. Like, what are people worried about when they're when they're worried? Economy. I mean, they're just worried about where the economy is going. And and the the, the ultimate one that I wanted to bring to you and, and get get your feedback and talk to you about is the labor market. I'm convinced it's a one of the biggest disruptions that's going on right now in my own businesses. I'm like very aggressively, proactively trying to figure out my own labor market. I mean, we've you know obviously we we've, we've gone all remote we have uh, unlimited vacation days we're we're about to implement some things at the end of the year that are incredibly incentivizing for people to work with us but that's because i have to get ahead of the the curve i want to take care of people i've always wanted to take care of people but the labor market is insane right now with people yes. i mean we we would here's an example um we were looking for an account manager recently uh, for our corporate marketing agency and we typically get about 27 30 resumes for it we got two and one of them sure. wanted, you know, we were going to, um, you know, it was some, you know, I, I can't do the salary because people will listen to this sure. that know me. But the, the person was wanted to double their salary to work for us. They said, I'll, I'll interview, but you have to double what you're listing the salary for right now. Well, that was uh, one of them. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and you know, two. that's happening in every single industry. It is. It's happening whether you're, you know, uh, uh, you have to be... A, at expert level to work for Phil, I might add, or if you're a programmer or if you're, yeah. but all the way, you know, restaurant workers, uh, house workers, whatever, uh, it's happening in every industry. Yeah. And I'll, it's very simple. What happened is this is what I said at the beginning of the pandemic. And, and I wrote about this too in an article, the pandemic accelerated everything that was already going yes, to happen. Correct. So if you were going to get a divorce in 10 years, you got a divorce in one year. If you were going to sell your business in 10 years, you sold it in one year. If you uh, were going to quit your job in five years, you quit or were fired that year. And not only that, it wiped the slate clean. There was no, all, all lifestyles were put on hold. So you had a chance, but, but you weren't put on hold. Your brain wasn't put on hold. You, you still need a life and a style. So you had a chance to think, well, what is the life I want to lead? And you could say, well, I don't need to spend whatever it is, 50,000 a year, 100,000 a year to live in New York City. I could spend 20,000 a year mm -hmm. to live in a suburb of Kansas City and be around my family and be around people I love and maybe do something online like... You know, there's there people always write about these so-called side hustles and this gig economy, or or I could work. Well, remote. you just well, hold on. Yeah, I'm going to The side hustle is real. What you ha as a business owner, if you're listening to this right now, you have to create that in your company, because the people that work for you don't want to do the same job every single day doing the same thing. They want to have a diverse portfolio of the things they want to work on, and that's how you're going to keep them. So what we try to talk about internally with, with our team is like, how do we get you to do a bunch of different things of the things you like to do, right? Now, there's always some stuff you don't like to do. You're going to have to do some of that. But for the most part, how do we give you this diverse portfolio to make you feel like you're an independent contractor within our own company? Like that, I'm trying to redefine how it looks, and I've never thought about it because I've been like, Hey, we're going to have a great culture and all that. Well, it's hard to do culture when no one's together anymore. 
No, I, I agree. So what, what you, what you have to do, and I've always tried to do this with every company I've started mm -hmm. is you, the, the, the job of the founder in part is you have to provide a motivating purpose, a vision. You have, I always imagine that people working with me, uh, and they always work with me. Nobody works for me. People working with me. Um, I want them to call their parents every night and say, mom, you can't believe what I did today. It's so great. And I want them to see that the opportunity is not rising up within a company. That's a stupid opportunity. The, the opportunity is rising up in terms of life. Like this is going to make my life better. It doesn't mean I'm going to, it doesn't mean an employee is going to stay with you forever. Phil, they're right. going to go on. You have to train them to go on and beat mm -hmm. you and, mm -hmm. and become better than you and find out what they really want to do. And, and, and hopefully you get to still do it with them. Um, but maybe not. Yeah, the, the, the factor that we saw was like, with, so we have about 40, 40, 45 employees at any time. What we kept seeing was for years, culture was built on connection. Like that was it. You know, how do we make better connections? How do we do things together, get to know each other, serve each other, all that kind of stuff. But because of the work remote issue right now, the connection's gone. And the culture has to be built on individual purpose. What's your individual purpose in this company? And are well, and, we serving that? And, and, and let me address that because there's, a, there's, there's, this is where corporate culture, even entrepreneurial culture intersects with the science of positive psychology. Mm. So there's three components of well-being: community, freedom, mastery. So community is you feel like part of your community. This is what you're calling culture. Freedom is a large percentage of your, of your decisions you make on your own and not because other people right. made them for you. And mastery is you feel that dopamine rush on a learning curve as you're improving something. Mm -hmm. And I feel a successful corporate culture, the way to attract and build colleagues is by giving people an opportunity for, for mastery, freedom, and community. So for instance, is someone getting better at I'll just take like a restaurant. Is someone getting better at understanding how even a waiter or a bus boy, are they getting better at understanding how a restaurant works? Can they mm -hmm. rise up and do their own restaurant? Can they get ideas for businesses to start in the restaurant space? So that's mastery freedom. Are they getting paid more or are they, are there opportunities to get them to be paid more? Uh, and community is, do you have good people working in the place mm -hmm. or, or, you know, somehow communicating with each other enough that they feel part of a, a community. It could even be a community bigger than, than your business. Like if someone works in cybersecurity, send them to cybersecurity conferences. So they feel part of the overall hacking community and, and so on. Yeah. It's just crazy. And so, and that's going to, that's never going away now. Like people have realized, oh, I just could move home, live near my parents, spend one fifth the price, make more money. Why should I go back to some stupid marketing job? Exactly doing the same thing, having to commute, you know, let's say 30 minutes each way, it's an hour of my day. And then I got to go sit in an office for eight hours doing the same thing. It just doesn't work anymore. In fact, one of the things we decided to look at was the difference in the workforce between virtual versus in person. And right now, 57.3% of the American workforce wants to be virtual. Think about that number. That is massive. Three years ago, that number was probably 10%. I, I agree. And you know, I will call out, I have, have, I, I respect deeply Jerry Seinfeld. I will call him out in his, the one area where he didn't just shit on me in his op-ed mm. in the New York times about my article. The one area where he tried to say something important is that he said, people don't want to work remote. And he said uh, in part, because when they're not working remote, they have more ideas, but he said, nobody wants to work remote. He was totally wrong. And I knew this then. Even you did, like, actually. I remember you calling this out at the time. Yeah, like, the, every research said at least 50% wanted to work mm -hmm. remote. Now it's even more because working remote is just simply better because you get to do more things in terms of your own personal community, your own personal freedom, and your own personal mastery. Like that happens when you work remote. Yep. And it's not like people like are hiding in a, in, in a bomb shelter. Like they're, they're, they're going to go out and talk to people or fo phone call people. Uh, you know, I've had people on the podcast say one thing they do is at the end of every day, call someone you're close to and, and communicate with them. So you still feel that closeness, even if you live by yourself and, uh, you know, that's people want to work remote and it's not, it, we're not, you, you can't Pandora's box has been open. You can't close it. 
Yeah, and and that's so. I think if people are there listening, I, I mean, I really do think the labor market is probably one of the most. I mean, it is in your face. It's going to happen. It's it's already happening. If you're trying to manage your team um, from the old way, you're going to lose very quickly. And for us, we're a labor driven business, so we have to adapt and we have to be on the forefront of this. And that's some of the ways we're looking at it. But that's where the world's going. It, and in fact, I'm going to try to write something soon just on how companies need to adapt based on what we're seeing in the data and the things that we've done, and, and try to give people. Um, some some help on that front because it, it people everywhere I talk to people are like oh my god I'm so screwed right now listen we went to a nice hotel this summer in um, Park City Utah and they the hotel made us pay full price except they were at thirty percent capacity as far as labor not not hotel guests <laughs> the hotel is being served at thirty no, percent of what they typically have but they made me at a sold out hotel pay full price it's a cliche that. The, the the mater first they're the mater d then you go in the bar and the same guy's the bartender right and then um yes. you go up to your room and the same guy's like changing your sheets yeah like it's become kind of a joke but this is what's happening and i don't know where this ends up but it's not gonna it might revert back a little bit but it's not gonna mm -hmm. fully revert back we're only gonna yeah, be moving I, forward from this again totally anecdotal but we did ask at the, one of the restaurants in the hotel we asked like uh well, where is what's going on with the labor here and he said they got their stimulus checks right they never they, they got they got furloughed during the pandemic they got the stimulus checks they got retrained in another job and they're not coming back they're not the people that worked in the hotel the people that worked in the restaurants they they're they've gone they're not coming back this is what the guy told us yeah and 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 people thought oh when the checks run out they'll come back that's not true because like mm -mm. you said they learned other things to do yep. there's other things than other than working retail at a store on the street you there's there's so many ways you can make three thousand dollars a month you know answering surveys online like there's lots of like obscure little ways to to make money that and that kind of gig economy is only growing i remember i'll tell you uh, an anecdote for myself, one time I was consulting for LinkedIn. This was in 2014 or 2015. And I asked them what percentage of job searches are related to the gig economy. It was more commonly called the gig mm -hmm. economy then. And they said something like, oh, it's very small, 0.1%. Well, now, the last mm -hmm. time I asked them, it's like last year, it was around 3%. So again, that's not a huge number, but right. it's 30 times more than it was before. So it's only yep. growing. And, uh, and, and people ignore things. People don't understand exponential growth. They don't understand that when something's s small, but still growing exponentially, it's going to be very big and ch life changing in just a right. few years. And yeah. that's what's happened. Uh, but l let me ask you this on, um, okay. So what, what about the micro? What about the yeah. marketing trends? So it, again, this is, um, it's a broad look. Every business is different, right? The way we, we look at each individual business's customer base and we can track them online and figure out everything about them. But what we're seeing a trend over and over again is the ineffectiveness of spending money on Facebook right now. Between the iOS updates, which uh, limited the ability to target your typical customer, uh, between the political cancellations and the hate spread on politics, whether it's right or left, there is a very big distrust right now, James, in the consumer marketplace to buy things on Facebook. The people think they're going to get canceled. They're not being targeted like they used to be, so they're not seeing the kind of things that they would typically buy. Um, we are seeing this weird trend over the last six months of consumers have moved away from spending money on Facebook. I guarantee you, anybody listening out there right now that has a business or is marketing their business right now that spent money on Facebook is probably nodding their head yes. Like, yeah, it's exactly what we've seen. Well, well okay, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Like, A, Facebook is easy to put a very low budget on. Like, I could do a, make an ad for $20 and I could still target pretty well. Mm -hmm. What's better? Like, if I wanted to sell, let's say nutritional supplements it's easy for me to target the right yeah. demographic well, i'm gonna tell you mm -hmm. i'm gonna tell you where to go okay <laughs> so but we've also seen a slight trend in a negative way on youtube ads um where again this isn't not this isn't just like us doing it for clients it's us looking at these our clients data 
their customer base and understanding that their movements have changed. While they're absolutely on Facebook, I'm not saying they've, they've, they've stopped consuming Facebook. They've just stopped buying on Facebook. They don't want to buy because they figure their data is going to be collected. Um, maybe they're going to get canceled if they buy this product. They don't, they don't trust the platform anymore. It's crazy to see what we've seen. And so, you know, and what we've seen, like we were talking, we were, we're working with a company right now. Well, they had a Facebook marketing company uh, on their team when they when we came on board. And when we showed them this data about their customers, about the uh, uh, on how Facebook was not a platform they should advertise, advertise on, they went, oh, or Facebook a marketing agency told us that we should be marketing there. And I'm like, well, of course they did. <laughs> They're in the area of Facebook marketing. Agency. Yeah, I mean, like that's what you have to be ca- careful of. It's like put your energies into where your customers are, not what the marketer tells you youth that you should be doing, right? But the other one, here, here are the two platforms we've seen people move to, which is crazy. Um, females have drastically moved over to Pinterest. I mean, on a level I've never seen anything like. Wow, that's so interesting. Like, what do they do there? I could. I, I don't know really. I mean, I've used Pinterest before. I have yeah. a Pinterest account, but yeah. I don't really wake up thinking, "Oh, I got to check Pinterest today." Well, I don't think you do. I think it's a predominantly female platform, but it is a platform that we see in our data that female, mostly female consumers, totally trust to see products, recognize products, research products, buy products. Like it's crazy how how much how what a trusted platform and you know here's the a common sense way of looking at it and all of the crazy social media um, you know CEOs that have been hauled up in front of Congress um, or have had leaks or have had nefarious memos written about them have you heard one thing from Pinterest no right and so thus people are trusting it. So we're, uh, but, but I also would think maybe it's so below the radar because people aren't using it. But you're telling no, me people are using no, it. No, you're wrong. Huge, massive, massive, massive platform for females. Like so, so, over, like crazy platform right now. I mean, Pinterest is a public company. Let me just take a look at it for a second. Um, pins is the symbol, P I N S. And uh, the 52 week high is 90, and it's only 43 now. So we could meet in a year and see if it goes from 43 higher. Yeah, that's a really interesting, I never thought about that, looking at the stock, but it is an interesting one I'm seeing. I'm seeing a massive trend over there, and I think they're going to see the effects of that. You know what I love about fantasy sports? is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. That's the easiest hundred dollars you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. 
Daily Fantasy Sports Made Easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking, Dan Brown on writing, or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. Let me just say a few things I like about Pinterest, the stock. I'm not recommending it here, but just, and, and obviously I'm not because this is the first time I've looked at it ever. So first off, they have $2 billion in cash. If you subtract out the debt, they still, they basically have two, $2 billion in free cash. Now you would say, well, that's meaningless if they're losing money, cause then mm -hmm. they'll run out of the cash, but they're making, uh, their operating cash flow is 383 million. So they're only adding to their cash. Their year-over-year -year revenue growth, 125%. And they're mm. not a new company. They've been around for mm -hmm. 10 years or so. Their um, inc net income is not so important. I like free cash flow, and that's the $383 million. But they're, you know, the, the, the kind of ratios people care about, the, the forward PE ratio, the price over earnings, the technical details are not so important, sure. is, is a modest 34, which is very reasonable for a tech company, particularly one that's going to maybe double again over the next year. I would say... Just at a glance, I would look into buying this company, mm -hmm. not recommending it, but I would consider, oh, this is the type of company that looks very good to me. I like that they have essentially no debt, lots of cash, and they make money, and it looks like they, they're not like overvalued. That, that is a flaw in my thinking. I never even thought about what they look like as a company publicly a public, as a publicly traded company. So thank you for that. That's, uh, that's really interesting. The other one, and this is going to make you happy, but we have seen a a massive shift in the last three months on a different platform that people have been talking about for years, but it's finally coming in heavy, and that's audio. Interesting. Audio platform, Spotify, podcasts, uh, iTunes, um, um, yep, everything, iHeartRadio, um, regular radio, traditional AM, FM has seen a massive spike. And so 
Um, and again, it's a trusting platform in, a, in an age where there's not much. We, we've looked at a lot of the privacy issues and the privacy issues are driving a lot of problems with the platforms right now. And that's why people don't trust to buy things on them. They think their stuff's going to be sold. They think they're, they're going to be exposed at some point and they could get in trouble. Um, but right now, audio platforms, the platforms in audio and the audio market are from an advertising marketing perspective, that is where the consumer market is moving more than I've ever seen it. So, so let me ask the obvious question. Like if I could watch something or listen to something, why wouldn't I watch it? Wait, why couldn't you do both? Yeah, I guess so. And also are people driving more? Like usually people listen to podcasts at the mm -hmm. gym, in their car mm -hmm. or at work. Mm -hmm. uh, but now all three of those things don't happen as much. Right, uh, yet the trend is over in that direction, which is fascinating to me. Yeah, because that means there's more kind of authentic interest in choosing audio over video for whatever reason. Right. And so you're saying, but you're saying from an advertising point of view, advertise on podcasts, not on YouTube videos. Right now, as a priority, I wouldn't give up Facebook or YouTube. I just have a different priority. Whereas maybe a year, two years, three years ago, Facebook and YouTube were leading the way and everything that we, you know, let's say you have a budget of a um, $1,000, right? Maybe 600 of it went to Facebook, 300 went to YouTube, and maybe 100 went somewhere else, right? Now it's just reversed all the way through. I mean, we're, we're looking at different um, allocations in the budgets of, market, of marketing budgets for the clients we work with. Now, um, and, um, and Facebook is definitely, it, it, Facebook is a branding platform, not a conversion platform. Just remember that. that that's, that's it on a bumper sticker. Whereas it used to be a conversion The best platform. conversion platform out there. And now you're saying Pinterest and podcasts. P Pinterest and any audio platform. So again, Spotify, um, traditional radio, uh, th those types of places where people can put their earbuds in and listen. That's where we're seeing so much conversion from the consumer market going. So where would you, like, let's say I wanted to advertise this podcast as an mm. example. Where would I advertise this podcast? Maybe on Pinterest? Yeah, I'd have, I mean, I'd have to look at you. We've done this for you. You know, we looked at your, uh, at yeah. your, what I call customers, but you know, they're your followers. We looked and I don't have it in front of me. Obviously I've, I've done hundreds of these, so I can't remember everything, but I'd want to know where their, where their earbuds and where their eyeballs are going. And then I would sit there and recommend a strategy for you and allocate it based on where they're converting, where they're where their attention is going, and then the messages they want to receive. Like, that's the key of the whole thing. Like, you can be on the right platforms, and if your message sucks, you're not going to get anything. And so what we also, you know, obviously we determined this in, in you, but like things that you needed to hyper-focus on uh, to communicate better and meet them where they are. Yeah. All right, so I have to, I want, I want to figure that out. I want to advertise the podcast a little bit. I'll, but, I'll resend your data report over. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Uh, so, okay. So Phil, I also want to ask you're the political expert. Okay. Are you, are you lining up for 2024 yet? Are people calling you? Are candidates calling you and wanting your services? We're, we're involved in a lot of governors and U S Senate races right now. I don't ask me specifically. I know you're Today's going there. Election I'm not going to do that. Huh? Today's election day. Today is election day in Virginia and, uh, New Jersey. We're involved in both New York states. City mayor. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. That's right. We almost were involved in that race. Um, and, uh, but, uh, we're involved in New Jersey and Virginia. We feel very good about our candidates there. So, uh, but on the 2024 or excuse me, 2022 side, we're involved in at least, you know, a combined 12, 15 races on governors and senator, U S senators right now in Congress and another five or six on very high targeted congressional races. So, so let's, let's just, let's just, uh, for just for five minutes, let's talk about 2024 presidential campaign. Uh, let's talk about the Democrats first. It feels like, you know, I, and I'm not saying anything good, bad, or political about any of these candidates and their issues, but just in terms of personalities and popularity, it seems like Joe Biden, obviously he'll be a candidate in 2024, but it seems like there will be people running against him on the Democrat side. I don't think he's, I don't think he's got a free pass in the primaries in 2024. I, I, I think the Democrats are still looking for someone who's somewhere in between personality wise and charisma wise, somewhere, somewhere in between a Joe Biden and an AOC, 
But I don't know who that person would be. I don't disagree, but I would say this. Something has to happen. Well, the midterms will determine that. The midterm elections. So a year from now, a year from now is a pretty big reckoning for a lot of things in this country. I really believe that. So, you know, you know, we've talked about this in the past, just, you know, I, I think we're coming to a reckoning in this country in a lot of different ways. I don't know how bad that will be. I don't know what will happen, but something weird is going to happen, I feel like, in the next few years. And I think what ha- I think is going to be you know, everything being equal, there's no major scandal or whatever. I, I think there's going to be a bloodbath for Democrats in November of 2022. I think Congress comes back to the Republicans, both on the U.S. Senate and the House, and then that's going to determine what you just said, that some, the, an alternative steps up to, to challenge Biden on the left. But then again, Clinton lost horribly in the 1994 midterm elections. I mean, the, the Dif- different Duke Gingrich took over. Yeah, different world, though, man. You know, yeah. and, and like, you know, maybe Biden gets so defeated and his numbers are so down that he just decides I'm done and they try to make, you know, Kamala – um, obviously they are a parent and then they try to, you know, surround her and they try to thwart anybody that would come from the left, but you could definitely see that playing out. Okay. So, so Republicans, yes, Trump could run, but I feel like also the Republicans need a personality and, and Trump showed that there wasn't a lot of personalities in the Republican party. He defeated, he was essentially a non-politician who defeated 18 other candidates in 2016 for the Republican primaries. Who's out there that could run? And I don't know all the names. Is is someone like a Kasich possible? Is a DeSantis? Is a Dan Crenshaw ready for the job? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think you could see. Uh, well, it all determ- It's all determined by Trump. What does he decide to do? So everybody's going to sit, you know, sit on their hands until he makes a decision. If he says he wants to run, do you think what? What do you think will happen? I think he gets a nomination. Uh. So let's see. Uh, I'm going to look at predict it. So yeah, Donald Trump is in the winning. Yeah. Is, is 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 first in first place by a, a long shot on predict it, which is a prediction market. He's got 43 cents. Ron DeSantos second. DeSantis yeah. second with 23 cents. Yeah. Nikki Haley third with uh, seven so cents. Yep. Yeah. I'd say uh, Josh Hawley. I, I'm not looking at it. I'm guessing Josh Hawley. Uh, he's not there, but you know, but that again, really? yeah, people like. But you know, at this level, below ten cents, it's like you have Mike Pence, yeah, Christine, you know, he, Christine Nome, uh, uh, Christine Nome's Alaska. there. Yeah, yep. Let's Ted see. Ted Cruz is there, but he has no chance. Ted Mike Cruz. Pompeo, Pompeo may want to run um, uh, the the Arkansas um, senator. I can't think of his name right now. Um, so I, you know, there's a lot of a lot of people that um, that are out there. So it's interesting. I guess it's too early to really game, and like you said. Uh, if Trump runs, what are the complications of him running? Like, obviously, he's engendered a lot of feelings on both sides. Is it is it too much? Can you have someone too controversial run? I, I guess clearly not. But uh, uh, what what what's you know will people who are middle of the road vote for Trump? Yeah, I don't. Uh, again, there's just. I mean, I'm not trying to avoid the the question. There's so many unknowns of where this thing goes. Like. But everything is so turbulent right now, James. I've never seen the turbulence as it is right now in this country. I know. Um, and I don't it, care, like, yes, would it be even more craziness, chaos, riots, all the crime, everything if Trump runs? Yeah. But it'd be the same thing, maybe a little bit less, but a lot of the same thing if DeSantis were to get the nomination, um, if some other candidate, Josh, I mean, Josh Hawley, or let's say Christy Nome, a woman governor, they, they tear, it'd be, you know, they tear her down. They're going to tear Biden down. They're going to, they, they, we, my thing is this, here's a question that popped into my head the other day. Has the political environment ever, it's kind of like we talked about in, in part one with my disease, right? The, in my, with the disease I had, there's never any improvement. It's just a deterioration, right? I'd say the same thing about the political system right now. Have, have we ever seen in the last 30 years things calm down without outside of a, uh, some crazy event like 9-11 or wherever? It, it feels yes. like it I just think people think constantly has been deteriorating for 30, 40 years now. I would say the 2012 election between Obama and Mitt Romney was a congenial election. Like people weren't at each other's throats. And I felt like the same human being 
could consider both sides and think about it. I mean, has it Whereas gotten better since 2012? No, it's definitely gotten worse because then it was 2016. Right. But I think I think maybe 2012 was a rare tick up. Right. And an anomaly. Yeah. So, I mean, 1998, we were, or sorry, uh, in 1996, we were dealing with potential impeachment stuff. 1992 was Bush, Clinton. And that was a war. Yeah. Uh, 1988 was the, when you first started seeing kind of Correct. this, these, these racial yep. uh, advertising, uh, with the Willie Horton ads and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Uh, you had Gary Hart in 1984 and that's when you start seeing like scandal journalism around politicians. Yeah. Uh, 1990 was Reagan Carter was kind of like, you know, that was a very, there were, there were opposites, you know, and then before that you had, you know, cleaning the country from Nixon before that you had Vietnam. So yeah, before that you had a sitting president not run when he could have, Lyndon B. Johnson. Yeah. 64 was right after Kennedy and Goldwater was accused of, of wanting to start nuclear war if he won. Uh, so yeah, uh, 1960 was almost as contested in the election results as 2000 because you know maybe yeah. JFK manipulated the results. So yeah, it's, it's pretty much deteriorated. The only thing I would say is 2012, I felt I could talk reasonably with friends about both candidates without mm -hmm. being yelled at. What about you? It's yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, but I, I just know it's it's been a consistent deterioration. So there's unless the system blows up, which I, I here's my belief that in 2016 that was the beginning. Trump's election was the beginning of blowing up our political system, where you could see, you know, outsiders. You know, I predicted Mark Cuban would run for president in 2016 after Trump, but you could also see where a third party like Andrew Yang's trying to create right now could be viable down the road. And then all of a sudden you're gonna see multiple parties like a European model. Uh, there, there's some kind of massive disruption going on right now. It hasn't sort of worked its way out. It, the first earthquake was Trump in 2016. And what you're just seeing is so, and so you're gonna see these third parties try to pick off enough of a majority of the right and the left to kind of win coalitions like they do in the European models. And so, I, again, that's one way of looking at it. The other is the whole system blows up and I don't know what's going to happen. The states secede. Um, we, we look more in a European model, like literally governance-wise than not political party, but like we have multiple countries that are all connected in some way. L um, let me ask you, like, what are you afraid of as a worst case scenario? Like what's, let, let's take a doom and gloom approach. And, you know, our friend, uh, Tucker Max, our mutual friend is, yeah. um, kind of on the, what, what he's calling doomer optimism that mm. things are going to crash and burn, but then a new, you know, good thing will arise. I, I don't know. I don't think I'm that, um, I don't think I'm a doomer, but I am scared, you know, that, you know, pe before the last election, people were talking civil war. I never heard people talk like that before. Well, I wrote about it a year ago or no, yeah. a year and a half ago. I wrote that I believed a civil war was coming yeah. no matter who won. And I said, in fact, I said, uh, Trump wins, the left's going to go nuts. Uh, Biden wins. And if he were to impose vaccine mandates, then you're going to see everything go crazy on, on the right and in other places. But what's interesting, let's just take that one thing. I mean, honestly, I wrote about vaccine mandates in the summer of 2020 as being one of the most disruptive things that could ever happen as far as our country. But what you're seeing right now, let's just talk, take the vaccine mandates. And again, um, I'm a, I'm a, if you want to get the vaccine, I think you should get the vaccine. I'm for choice, right? Um, but my point is, is that you're seeing African-American communities, you're seeing Hispanic communities, and you're seeing right-wing communities all coming together over this. And you're seeing on the other side sort of affluent, um, you know, sort of left-wing uh, communities and non-affluent left-wing communities coming together on the other side. And you're seeing medical communities uh, come together on some parts of this. And so uh, split, right? So you're seeing these weird coalitions that are coming together. I I've never seen the kind of coalitions we're seeing right now. It's so strange. And I think that's going to bear out in a lot of these political elections. And so in the next, you know, from, from 2021 uh, in Virginia and New Jersey, to 2022 in the midterms. So it is, that's where it's going to show its face first. And then we'll see what the fallout comes from that. Well, uh, Phil, it's going to be exciting. And it's really exciting to keep pace with what I like about always talking to you is you have definitive things that you said that we could keep track of and, and look <laughs> back and see the results. And you've been so dead on in everything. 
And I appreciate because I've been using I, things that you've suggested and ideas you've suggested. And Oh, I got one, one more, yeah, one more. This will me. be real quick, real quick. One of the things that we're seeing in the messaging of marketing right now is if you are an American company, say American made, the supply chain issue is such a, uh, a, a stressful thing on businesses that if you're able to say uh, our company is American made, American manufactured, then people go, oh, I'll buy that because it's not going to be disrupted for my, my life. So we've started instituting that in a lot of our corporate client campaigns, media campaigns, that they're American made business. And that has been crushing for us right now. I could see that, you know, it's so funny because, you know, like for instance, right now I'm still in the process of building what I call as a zoom competitor. And we see in a lot of the platforms that are in this space that they're all routing their video through China or Taiwan. Oh, interesting. Uh, you know, some countries have, have problems with these platforms because a lot of the video processing happens outside the U.S. and people want U.S. even for video, even for their video processing, not just for you know their clothes and their food and stuff like that. In a weird way, again, I know this can sound political. I don't mean it to, but like Trump kept saying, we need to bring our manufacturing back to the states, right? And what you're seeing now is people coming around to that message. So if, like, let's just go back to the original conversation. If Trump were to run. That would be the message I would tell him to run on, which is, yep, yeah, Amer American made, American manufacturing. Let's bring it back here. Uh, let's get it. We've got to get out of China. We've got to get out of the other markets where the supply chain is being disrupted. Yeah. And, and look, the reason that historically we've shifted to those other markets is because they were quote unquote cheap labor. Cheap. But, but A, it, it, the, the living conditions of that cheap labor are miserable. Now, would it be better if they didn't have us? Probably not, but, you know, whatever. But the other thing is, it's not like there's going to be, things are moving from human labor to robot labor anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's not like suddenly those horrible working conditions are going to be replicated here. Right. It's going to be like Amazon warehouses where it's like all robotic. So, uh, you know, the nature of labor is changing. So there's no reason not, there's no reason not to bring it back here and avoid the supply chain issues we're currently facing. Yep, exactly. So that was my last little tip. I forgot to tell. Well, Phil, thanks so much once again. You are a regular guest and a good friend. And in part one, we discussed not only your health, but your your philosophy on moonshots. Mm. And here we talked about the economy and politics. And I'm glad you're you're feeling better. Please keep us up to date on that. And thanks once again. Yeah, thanks, James. Look around. You can find cars like these on Auto Trader. New cars, used cars, electric cars, maybe even flying cars. Okay, no flying cars, but as soon as they get invented, they'll be on Auto Trader. Just you wait. Auto Trader.